There we go. Hello, um, welcome to our uh, to the Cumberland County Historical S Society's uh, first speaker se series uh, for the 2024 year. Today, Brianna D'Agostino will be speaking for us. She is one of the Cumberland County Historical Society docents at the Alan Carmen Prehistoric, Prehistoric Museum. Brianna is also a part of the local Nanakoke Lenny Lenape Tribal Nation of South Jersey. Throughout Brianna's life, her main goal has been to always spread the knowledge and culture of her people and their existence on the Lenape Hoking land. Throughout Brianna's academic career, she has been able to create an Indigenous Studies minor program at Montclair State University, has been around the East Coast giving presentations to universities, museums, and schools, and has recently completed her master's degree in Indigenous Studies. Currently, Brianna is a high school teacher, a high school history teacher, and an employee at the Cumberland County Historical Society. Today, she will be giving her talk titled The Nanakoke Lenape people of New Jersey and their struggle to be sovereign. Thank you, Brianna. <laughs> so hello, my name is Brianna D'Agostino. Um, like Britt just said, um, New Lay Lindum Alley Pack. Um, thank you all for coming here. Um, and I am very excited to share with you guys a little bit about my tribe um, and the process it took me to write my thesis um, that helped me learn more and more about my tribe and tribal nations all throughout the United States and our struggle with being sovereign and being um, our own identity. And Britt, when you're ready, you can go to the next slide. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, take your time. All right, so before I get into talking about my thesis um, and the work that was around that, I'm going to give a little introduction on, you know, my tribe, who we are, um, because that is very important to the thesis in general. So like Britt said, I am part of the Nanakote Lenny Lenape Tribal Nation, and we are actually two tribes that are combined as one. So the first part of that, the Lenape people. Um, if you can see from this picture right here, the Lenape people housed all of New Jersey southern New York, eastern Pennsylvania, and northern Delaware. We have three different clans. We have the turkey clan, the turtle clan, and the wolf clan. And those clans are based on your family, and they're both based um, geographically and personality-wise. So specifically for my clan, we are the turtle clan. I have some representatives in the back. If you want to see later, we have our little logo um, that has all of our family names on there as well. And South Jersey, we are called the turtle clan because if you guys go kayaking around here, the rivers are full with turtles, um, a lot of turtle families. Also, if you know South Jersey, we're country folks down here. We're very slow. We take our time. We're not like North Jersey folks that are all about the city, very fast paced. So just like turtles, we're very slow and we need to think about a lot of things. We need to think about making decisions. So that's why South Jersey is named the Turtle Clan. So the Lenape people, we are known as the grandfather tribe, meaning that we are one of the most earliest um, and biggest tribes within the Northeastern coast. And a lot of those uh, very popular tribes that we know about, um, those tribes within the Iroquois Confederacy, the Cherokee, the Chickasaw, the Choctaw tribe all came from the Lenape people here in New Jersey. And throughout settlers coming over and us being displaced, that is why those other bigger tribes moved to where they moved, whether that was in the south or in the north, and they became their own tribal nation. However, we all have a lot of similarities within our tribe. Um, both religious-based, language-based, um, and clan-based as well. A lot of those tribes still to this day come to us Lenape people, um, since we are those grandfathers to talk to us about those ceremonies, about that ancient knowledge, about that religion, about that language, because it all came from us. Um, so being a part of this grandfather tribe means something so special to me, and I'm so happy I was able to grow up with that knowledge and that ancestral knowledge and be called a grandfather, grandmother at such a young age. 
So some things about the Lenape people is we have equal gender roles. Um, this is very different from what we hear about in England history, European history, how, you know, the patriarchy, the men are usually at the top. Except for the Lenape people, our gender roles were very equal, if not women were higher respected than men. Women were the ones that made the decisions. Um, when we went to war, the women were the ones that made those first territorial decisions on when to um, sell or give land to settlers. Um, so also coming from that aspect in my culture and my tribe has made me such a strong and powerful woman because growing up in this tribe, our women are so appreciated and I'm able to now stand here and stand tall and be confident because of those confident women within my tribal nation. And also a big misconception is that all Native Americans live in teepees. I know everyone has learned about that um, in high school or grammar school. That is why I'm a high school teacher to try to get rid of these myths nowadays. However, my people, we lived in wigwams. Those were big, long wooden houses. Um, and we still have wigwams to this day. There's wigwams on our tribal territory still to this day that we hold our ceremonies in. And they're pretty big mansions. They could fit up to four or five families. Um, and they would have a big center that had a fire where you could eat, where you could cook your food, and where you would have warmth when you were sleeping as well. So that's just a little bit about the Lenape people. Now, on the second half of that is our Nanakote family. Again, we're called the Nanakote Lenny Lenape. So we have our Nanakote tribe. Our Nanakote tribe, they had always believed that they were an offset of the Lenape people and that they were part of that turkey clan, those three clans that I told you about. The turkey clan, they came from the middle um, of New Jersey and um, also from southern New York as well. And they were known as the roamers because turkeys roam around and they usually roam together in families. So it had been said through our stories, our oral histories, that the Nanakote tribe roamed around, and they roamed all the way to Chesapeake, Maryland area back in the beginning of times. And there, that is where they stayed up until the 1650s, up until the 1700s, when they started to get displaced by European settlers. So then, while they were at that Chesapeake area, they started to get displaced, and they came all the way back up here to our Lenape grandfathers, and they intermixed once again in the early 1700s. And when they intermixed once again, that is when our tribe, the Nanakote Lenny Lenape, came together in South Jersey and officially made our family and our community. You can go on. Thank you. So a common misconception is that Native Americans are people of the past, that we no longer exist, that we were all wiped out, whether that because, be because of the Trail of Tears, us going to the West, or because of settler invasion. However, if we were not here, I wouldn't be here and I would be a ghost speaking to you. So we are not people of the past, we are people of today. And there's also a big misconception that, you know, we still wear these clothes every day, that we still wear that buckskin clothing or that we're still dancing and, um, you know, doing all these things on a daily basis and that we're not modernized. However, as you see me today, I'm in jeans, a sweater, I'm modernized. Um, and I don't wear this stuff every day. This is my traditional regalia, my traditional native wear. However, we only wear that for special occasion, for ceremony, for powwow, et cetera. Um, we are very modernized today. We adapt just like every other culture adapts. And we are not people of the past. We are people of today. So what I like to um, look at this picture right here, this happened this past summer. This was a Lenape language camp that happened at Princeton University, one of the top universities, hosted all Lenape people from all over, not just the um, this country, but of Canada as well. And this was the first time that all Lenape tribes, all of our family had came together since we were displaced. And luckily I was invited. I'm right there smiling. <laughs> um, and it was a very monumental moment that this was the first time our families had all been together since Europeans had um, displaced us and that diaspora had happened. Um, and one of the biggest things which I'll talk about later in um, the lecture is that language revitalization is such a big thing to help us be sovereign and to help us be that recognized tribe, um, not just for Lenape people, but for Native Americans all over. So it is very great to me that I got to be a part of this monumental um, camp that happened this summer.
You can go on. All right, so now getting on to my thesis. So I had the opportunity to go to graduate school and it's a very big thing for me because not many people can afford or have you know the drive to go to graduate school. It's a very hard task to do. And I know my other graduate school graduates can attest to that. However, when I was in graduate school, I went to Rowan University. None of the classes that I was taking were classes that I wanted to pursue. I was paying all this money, but I was learning about German history, European history, um, or history of presidents that, frankly, I really didn't care about. And I realized I wanted to get my money's worth out of graduate school. So I took the leap, and I went to my advisor and said I wanted to go to the thesis track. And the thesis track of history graduate school is you basically writing a book. And you don't have to, you take less classes, but it's because you're solely focused on writing this thesis or this book. And I knew this was gonna be a challenge, but I knew it was something I wanted to do because I knew I wanted to get my money's worth out of graduate school, but I also wanted to change people's thinking of indigenous people, especially within the 21st century. So that's why I changed and started writing my thesis. And I, at first I didn't know what I wanted to write my thesis about. I thought I wanted to write it about the history of my tribe and our dances and our cultural aspects. And then my advisor said, well, you know, your tribe had a really big lawsuit with New Jersey. How do you feel about writing about that? And I was very scared because I am not someone who knows much about laws, much about political aspects, and much, and not much about tribal politics as well. Um, it kind of scared me. I was a little kid when um, all of this was happening and I didn't want to get myself involved in that. And then someone in my mind spoke to me and I'm believing now was creator and my ancestors saying, this is time for you to challenge yourself to learn about those tribal rights, to learn about that history and learn how these politics are interfering with your tribe and your sovereignty. So then I changed my thesis track again and I said, instead of writing about the cultural history of my tribe, I'm gonna write about the political history of my tribe and everything my tribe had went through up until 2018 when we won this lawsuit. So the official name of my thesis is called Tribal Rights Are Important Rights, The Origins, Travails, and the Impact of the Nanako Lenny Lenape Tribe versus the state of New Jersey. And it was officially published in June. Tell me a little bit. Again, more of the reasons why I chose to write this thesis once I was doing more of my research was one, the East Coast tribes, they're often forgot about when people look at tribal histories, especially modern day histories. Again, because of that trail of tear, tears that Andrew Jackson had done, a lot of people thought that East Coast tribes no longer existed, that all of us East Coast tribes migrated to the Midwest or the West, or that we were forgotten about and died. So a lot of that modern day history for East Coast tribes is not there. And a lot of that history is just oral histories now, it's not written down. And then I realized again, not enough discussion is happening about racism, modern day racism versus indigenous nations. And we'll learn about that more as we go on. There's a lot of modern day racist tactics that pol um, politicians use um, to inhibit indigenous tribes from being able to prosper. And again, there's not enough discussion on the differences between state and federal recognition. So while I was doing my research, I realized I didn't know a lot about state and federal recognition. And you as well probably do not know a lot because it does not affect you. However, it affects indigenous nations all over on what type of grants we can get, what type of publicity and what type of funds we can get as well. And again, not enough scholarly works are being done to include indigenous voices. A lot of my thesis is based on oral histories, which means interviews being passed down. And this was a big controversy as I was writing my thesis because there's no, as they say, quote unquote, written accuracy to oral histories. However, my oral histories that I wrote about were all backed up by written accounts. It just takes that extra research to find that accuracy. And again, number five, I wanted to challenge my academic ability. I wanted to stop being comfortable and to start 
you know, trying to learn more about the abilities that I have within myself. So this is the abstract of my thesis. I'm not going to read this all and bore you because we're going to get into it um, and all the nitty gritty of my thesis. However, again, my thesis is about the lawsuit of New Jersey versus the Native American group, our group, the Nanakote Lenny Lenape. And it happened from 2018 or 2015 to 2018. And it was primarily based on the concern of casinos and how big casinos are within tribal nations. All right, so again, casinos. I did not know this until I started writing my thesis, was that casinos are a big economically prosperous way for tribal nations to be able to fund not only their tribe, but the community around their tribal nations. And the first ever casinos um, were actually trying the police were trying to um, ban them from having tribes have casinos because they knew that they would get the, the tribes would get the money and that the state would not. So federally recognized tribes. So the Nanako Lenny Lenape tribe and our three other tribes within New Jersey are not federally recognized. We are only state recognized. However, when you are federally recognized tribe, you are able to have land of your own. That is that reservation land. If you look at a map of the Midwest, especially Oklahoma, you see that there is a lot of land that is specifically granted towards different tribal nations. And it is because they are federally recognized, they get that own land. When you live on that federal um, reservation land, that law within that land is Indian law. It is not the United States law, which means if you, an outsider, go to that reservation land and you get arrested, you are in Indian prison. Very scary because they have their own laws and they're allowed to do whatever they want with you. It is not U.S. land anymore. Even though it's specifically in the U.S., it is Indian land. It's our own little country. Um, so just watch out if you ever go in the Midwest. Um, and with that reservation land, you also get money from the federal government. Um, any Native American, you get a monthly um, paycheck from the federal government by being federally recognized. And that can be anywhere from $1,000 to $5,000. Um, so you really, if you want to live large, you can live large. You don't have to work. However, what you have to remember is on these reservation lands, the grocery stores, they're about 20 miles away, and a gallon of milk is about $20. So even though you're getting money from the federal government by being federally recognized, you also have to pay extreme, extreme prices for different basic necessities as well. It's kind of that give and take. And again, you get land grants. Um, you get grants to go to college. You get grants on jobs as well by being federally recognized. Now being state recognized, again, that is what my tribe and the two other tribes in New Jersey are. We do not have reservation land of our own. We do not have land grants of our own. That is why we live in Cumberland County. If we were federally recognized, you'd be living on Indian land right now. And we also have to buy our land. So we have um, tribal land in Cumberland County. However, we had to buy that. It was not given to us because we are state recognized. We do not get that land grant. We do get some types of federal grants. We did have free college as well for our people. However, we will talk how that free college was taken away from us by politicians. Um, and we do not get as much money as federal re federally recognized tribes do. However, one thing, that is good about state recognized tribes, that is not good about federally recognized tribes, is that we get to stay a little bit autonomous. We don't have to have that direct relationship with the US government. Again, it's give and take. Federally recognized tribes, they have to answer a lot to the US government um, and have that working relationship with them. State recognized tribes, we don't have to have that. And again, we have a lot of trauma with the US government. So if we do not wanna work with them, we do not have to. And again, federally recognized tribes, they are allowed to have casinos and tribal gaming within their reservation land. A lot of these reservation lands have very prosperous casinos on them. 
And again, that helps them sustain their people and their tribal land economically. However, state recognized tribes, we are not allowed to have casinos or tribal gaming. That is why you don't see a casino here in Cumberland County. The only casinos we have near us is in Atlantic City. However, we will talk about a lot of these politicians in New Jersey did not know the different politics and political structures of state and federally recognized legal outlines. And they thought that the Nanakote Lenny Lenape were trying to make a casino, even though it's specifically illegal for us to do so. So this is just a chart that I included in my thesis, and it shows um, a report that was done from 2020 to 2022, and it indicated the Native Americans' rate of unemployment. And if you see, it's a very, very high rate, and it's comparable to the Great Depression. Now, this is just Native American communities. This is not um, the United States community as a whole, just Native American communities. And this is a very important graph because it shows how those casinos, those tribal gaming institutions are very, um, very inherent and very um, important to tribal nations because we have one of the highest unemployment rates. So by being, being able to have these casinos on reservation land for our tribal people, they're able to get jobs. They're able to fund themselves economically and their family. Um, and it's very important, especially from the pandemic, that our people are able to have these jobs to support themselves. And again, this is another unemployment rate showing you how Native Americans are the highest unemployment group within minority groups of the United States. So again, our casinos, our tribal gaming institutions within those federally recognized lands are very important for indigenous communities as a whole because it gives us that money to help us and our nation. So again, like I said, there's not a lot of works that are talked about on modern racism. We learn about the cowboy and the Indian in school. We learn about how Indians were called savages in school as well. Um, but again, a lot of people believe that Indians passed away and we're no longer here in the 21st century. So of course there can't be racism if we're no longer here. However, there is a lot of modern day racism towards indigenous communities. And one of those racist tactics, those stereotypes is um, the nation stereotyping Indians as lazy, that we don't wanna get anything done, that we're not hard workers. And this is not new to us. This stereotype of lazy Indian had been around for centuries. However, when casino gaming took a big um, turn when many indigenous nations started to become federally recognized, it turned into the lazy Indian that wanted to just be at casinos and wanted to spend all of their money at casinos. So again, Indians, they're, they're opening up gaming institutions on their lands and white businesses to compete with those Indian gaming institutions started to um, portray and stereolize this lazy Indian stereotype in the mass media to try to get people to steer away from those Indian gaming sites as well. And again, if you ask Native Americans about this lazy Indian stereotype, they will tell you that it directly came from that passing of Indian gaming. So in 1993, we have New York Times. Um, they publish an article that has some comments from the great Mr. Donald Trump. And he talks about Indian gaming and some things that he says was what they're doing, the tribes, is wrong and it's disgraceful. And he believes that the only reason that the groups are seeking tribal federal recognition status is so that they can open up casinos. And he says it's amazing how so many people are claiming tribal rights all of a sudden. If you don't know Donald Trump's long history in the state of New Jersey, before he was president, he was a big casino entrepreneur. Okay, we have those Trump Towers that are now demolished um, in Atlantic City. Karma does its work. Um, but when federally recognized tribes started opening up casinos, especially in the 1990s, he was very upset, especially in New Jersey, because he did not want competition with his Trump Towers. 
Now I will tell you later how our tribes had been um, state recognized 10 years at this point in the 1990s. And for some reason, again, he thought because we were state recognized that we were going to open up a casino. But again, like I said, state recognized tribes were not allowed to open up casinos. However, he was so worried about us he did not do his research to know that we were not allowed. And he would continue to bash my tribe, the Nanakote, Lenny Lenape tribe, and many tribes throughout the East Coast when they started to open up their own casinos when they became federally recognized. So this is a little timeline that I tried to um, kind of simplify that is all throughout my thesis that talks about the um, the rise of the lawsuit itself. So in the 1960s and 70s, if we look at the very beginning, we have AIM, that is shortened for the American Indian Movement. It was a red power movement that was happening at the same time as the civil rights movement, the black power movement, the feminism movement, and the LGBTQ movement that we learn about in history classes. However, a lot of people don't learn about the American Indian Movement in history classes. However, they aim to spark that power that just like Martin Luther King and Malcolm X did as well for Indian nations to rise up to get those rights, both politically and socially. And because of the American Indian movement, our tribal nation that had been hiding in the shadows of South Jersey came out to be a political body. And we started to petition on the streets of Bridgeton and we started to ask that our Native American nation here in South Jersey be state recognized. And only 10 years later, the three Native American tribes in South Jersey were state recognized. In 1980, we have the Ramapo and Powhatan that were state recognized. And in 1982, the Nanakote Lenny Lenape were state recognized. So it only took 10 years for us to petition and petition for New Jersey to finally state recognize us. However, as soon as we were state recognized, that is when we have these casino entrepreneurs and we have different politicians that are trying to take that state recognition away from our tribe in very sneaky ways, may I add. So in New Jersey, 1991, some things that they had to do to reinstate our state recognition every year was to put in different acts that would then prove that we were state recognized. So 1991, they reassigned birth certificates, meaning that now our grandparents and our parents could now have American Indian on their birth certificate. My mom, she had her birth certificate that said Moors, which means you're more black than white. So during this time, she was allowed to reassign her birth certificate to finally say Native American or American Indian. In 1995, you have the creation of the New Jersey Commission of Indian Affairs. This is still an act today. This is a commission that is public that you guys can um, come to and um, watch on Zoom. And it talks about all of the different things that are coming up within different tribal nations in the state, different events, um, different lawsuits, different um, important information as well. And this is a great um, way to learn more about your tribal nation. And then in the 1990s, we have Donald Trump. As I said, he said those comments in New York Times article in 1993. However, he did a lot of unpublic things as well. And one of the things that he did very sneakily was he took away Nanako Lenny Lenape tribal land that we were going to buy in Salem County, New Jersey. So we had a big plot of land in Sal Salem County, New Jersey that we were only a couple hundred thousand dollars away from buying, okay? And we had gotten different Green Acre grants. A Green Acre program is a program in New Jersey. It's an environmental program that gives out grants to help restore New Jersey land. And they were going to help us buy that land so that we could restore it and put our tribal um, community there. However, Trump got to talk to these different heads of the Green Acres program, and they pulled their grants away from the Nanakote Lenny Lenape tribe in the 1990s. And this has been confirmed that it was him that did this. And again, he thought we were going to put a casino there. So that is why he enacted his sneaky ways to get that land away from us. However, we were lucky enough to buy land right here um, in Fairton, New Jersey to have our tribal nation there. 
So then in 2001, we have the Indian Arts and Crafts Board. This is a part of the federal government's Department of Interior. And they send out an inquiry to New Jersey. And they ask New Jersey how many recognized tribes they have so that they can include them within the rights of selling Indian arts and crafts. If you don't know, we have a headquarters in Bridgeton, New Jersey, where you can buy our arts and crafts now that are labeled under Indian arts and crafts. However, instead of the New Jersey Indian Affairs Commission replying in 2001, somehow the State Division of Gaming replies. The State Division of Gaming, that is all about casino gaming, okay? And they reply that we have zero state recognized tribes within New Jersey. Now, not only is that very wrong, but that's very illegal because you are lying to the federal government. And again, we had been state recognized at that point for 20 years officially. So because of that in 2001, that is when our downfall and our fight with New Jersey started to happen, just because of that letter that the gaming um, the Division of Gaming had sent, saying that there was zero state-recognized tribes. But because of that, we were no longer allowed to sell our Indian arts and crafts and label it Indian arts and crafts. We were no longer allowed to get commission for that ancestral work that we did and we sold just because of that one letter sent back. And then the New Jersey census from year 2000 to 2010 listed us in the census of having tribal area and state recognized tribes. So it just shows you how some parts of our New Jersey government was saying that we did not exist, that we were not state recognized. However, other parts like the census was saying that we were here. So it was a back and forth battle. And then in 2006, New Jersey, they conducted a report where they went to all three of the tribes to talk about issues that they needed fixed. And New Jersey did this. They sent their own representatives to us in 2006. And the biggest issue that we said needed to be fixed was people knowing that we were state recognized so that we could get those grants so that other state departments could not deny us of getting money, of getting that sovereignty. And however, that 2006 report was never officially um, brought out, sent forth. Nothing happened. It was just a report done for nothing because they did nothing to help us. And then in 2011, the three New Jersey tribes, the Ramapo, the Powhatan, and the Nanakote, Lenny Lenape, signed a law that said that they would never be interested in having any casinos in New Jersey if they were federally recognized. And this was a way for us to tell the New Jersey government, to tell Donald Trump that we had no interest we just wanted to be here. We just wanted to be sovereign and to practice our tribal rights. However, again, nobody really cared. And we did not still have our rights to Indian arts and crafts, even though it had been 10 years. And we still did not have several grants that we should have because of this one letter that the State Division of Gaming had sent in 2001. And then in 2012, the Nanakote Lenny Lenape tribe, my tribe, was fed up with us not having our basic civil rights. So we hired a lawyer to officially start the case against New Jersey. And then by 2015, that is when our case finally reached the heads of New Jersey and we started our lawsuit. And at first it was a state lawsuit and then it would turn to a federal lawsuit. So this is that letter that the um, gaming sent to the Federal Indian Arts and Crafts Board. Lucky, luckily for me, I was able to be able to get all of these letters that nobody thought would ever be shown to the public or shown to the light of day. Um, however, these are all included within my thesis to show the racist backing that some of these departments in New Jersey had against us. And then this is the 2010 census. This is, um, it kind of got cut up, cut off up there, but it says um, Native American, American Indian sites. And if you see right here, 
it says Nanako Leni Lenape. So again, it's that back and forth where some departments are recognizing our state recognition status and other departments within New Jersey were not. And then after a long couple years battle within the New Jersey um, government system back and forth, the case from 2015 to 2018 was a closed court case. New Jersey decided they did not want a jury. They thought that a jury would steer towards um, our tribe in favor. And they thought if they did not have a jury that the judge would pick the New Jersey government over the Nanakote Lenny Lenape tribe. However, they were very, very wrong. And the judge ordered in favor for our tribe. And in 2018, the Nanakote Lenny Lenape tribe wins against the state of New Jersey. And what we won was our state recognition status to be officially entitled, which meant that they could never again say that there were no state recognized tribes in New Jersey. They could never try to take away our Indian arts and crafts grants, our money. They couldn't um, diminish us from our civil rights and from the types of, um, what's the word I'm trying to say? It's a Sunday, it's a rainy Sunday. <laughs> they could not diminish us from the rights that we had with the state recognition status, whether that meant money, whether that meant um, different college funds, et cetera, they could not take that away from us anymore. And this is the letter that was sent to our tribe in 2018. Um, our past chief, his name was Chief Gould. Um, this is what Phil Murphy sent to say that we were officially formally recognized as a state recognized tribe and that the state recognition that we had got in 1982 was valid and it should have never, ever, ever been diminished from us. So within my thesis, I still have these questions and I like to bring up these questions to my audiences as well to um, have you guys think um, and to have you do your own research and you know learn more about tribal nations. Um, why are tribal nations not automatically given recognition? You know, we were the first ones here. This is our land, whether you like it or not. And we should already be automatically given that recognition, those rights, and to be able to work together with our governments instead of fighting. And then why do tribal nations have to fight so hard for their sovereignty on their land? So again, sovereignty, that independence, trying to be independent, okay? We should be able to be independent nations. We should able, be able to practice our religion, to practice our, our dances, to practice our way of life without being restricted in any way. And then why do state governments and federal governments make the process of obtaining recognition so difficult? So again, it's a very hard process to get state and federally recognized. Again, it took us 10 years to get state recognized and we're still trying to get federally recognized. So why does it take that long? Why are they making it such a difficult task when again, this is our land? And some answers that I have came up with with my research is because of that continuous racism and that fear that indigenous nations will one, be successful, I have learned that the government's biggest fear is for Indian nations to rise up and be successful because they're scared we're gonna rise up and revolt when all we want to do is just coexist and be friends. Or two, become stronger than the government. Again, we have those federally recognized nations that have their own land, their own government, and they're scared that the whole nation is going to be like that. Or number three, try to take something away that is rightfully theirs, whether that's land, money, or artifacts as well. And again, this is an ongoing discussion that I like to have with myself, with my family, with others on different topics of state and federal recognition. So I want to say thank you. In my language, we say wanishi to say thank you. So thank you for coming um, to this open discussion. This is my first lecture in a long time, so I feel a little bit rusty. But if you got what I said, Thank you. And now it's open discussion. I will try to answer the best I can, but again, I am, I'm not an elder, so I still have a lot of learning myself, but I do have elders here.
Where so, was the land in Salem County that you were attempting to purchase? I don't know where it was at specifically. I just know it was at Salem County. That didn't show up in your research? No. Thank you. Can we go back to the slide with the letter that the um yeah. the, the gaming. gaming commission sent? I like read part of it and I was like, it was kind of crazy to me at the bottom. Oh yeah, the the font. We don't we don't have any official procedure for granting state recognition. Mm -hmm. We do recognize these three tribes, but there's no official reason for it. Yeah, it's kind of interesting that you can put that both in the same letter. Yes, again, it was a very very back and forth with different departments. Not so much pictures. Mm -hmm. it again. Yeah. It's like, no, it's real. They said it. Decades ago, state legislators passed resolutions mm -hmm. that designated three tribes, and your tribe is listed there. Mm -hmm. But then right above that, they said, we don't recognize tribes. Yep. Cool. Excellent. What are some of the criteria that the federal government, I mean, you must have a list of mm -hmm. things, and what is the stumbling block? So why is it taking so long to go through whatever criteria it is that they So for federal recognition, there's criteria, I think it's A through A through I. Um, that's They don't do numbers, they do alphabet. Um, and some of the things that they make you find our proof of civilization back from the 1700s. So you have to have documents back from the 1700s saying that you are an official tribe. You have to have proof of leadership of government. So um, having proof of different chiefs back until the 1700s, which again is very hard for us because we did not write stuff down. It was all oral history. You need proof of where you lived, that your tribe lived in a specific area. So for my tribe, we would need proof that we lived in South Jersey ever since the 1700s, which luckily we do have proof of that. Um, you need proof of land, um, giving land, like treaties as well to show that you are a government. Those are some of the um, criteria. You also need proof of genealogy, um, a big thing for Native Americans. Um, every Native American, we have to trace our genealogy because if for some reason we have one ounce of non-Native in us, then we're not Native to um, the federal government. So like me, I'm half Native, I'm half Italian, um, and I recognize myself as Native. However, for the federal government, they may not because they want every Native American to be completely full-blooded. However, in the world, I don't think anybody's completely full-blooded of their race um, or their culture. Um, so those are just some of the things. State recognition, it's a little bit more lenient. Um, you just have to be able to have proof up until the 1900s. Talk about the current status of the land return movement and how it's affecting the larger tribal nation. I know that the Methodist United Methodist Church has agreed to give any any church properties that are no longer with a viable congregation to the tribe, mm -hmm. and also that uh, the Nature Conservancy, was it, or the New Jersey Conservation, one of the land mm -hmm. the trusts and the state uh, put together a deal recently, and I'm not sure whether it was with the tribe directly or with the Native American Advancement Corporation, but that's a chunk of land in Salem County. Mm -hmm. um, how does this, this fit in with Yeah, so the past two years, lucky enough, we have had a lot of um, companies, businesses, and people step forward that want to give our tribal nation land, um, donate it. Um, we've had a lot of churches come about who have churches that they no longer use, uh, whether they moved or went to another church that they are giving us. Um, and luckily, we have been able to take almost all of that land, um, especially churches that don't have grave sites. Um, because of the grave sites, we don't want to take that land because, again, we don't want outsiders um, onto our tribal area. However, we know families want to visit their deceased loved ones. So those churches that do not have grave sites, we've been able to take. Um, and we have big plans. We want to make it, you know, either uh, senior citizen development homes for our senior citizens, be able to have uh, child care, day cares for our um, indigenous little kids, um, or to just have different areas to have ceremonies at. Um, and that's all throughout Cumberland County that we've been able to have. I think we got like two churches. Um, and we just got them within the comp uh, last couple months. So we have a lot of um, just work ahead of us as well. I don't know much about the environmental one, 
Um, but if we did get that, that'd be great too. Uh, Thais, yeah. Um, 2013, my last year of teaching, I had a, a young woman from your tribe who was applying for scholarships for Native Americans, mm -hmm. and she said she could not get them. Is that because of this recognition problem? Yep. Would that be changed now? Um, for her instance, yes, that was because that was right in the, you know, height in the middle of all of these issues. Um, as of right now, we don't really get that many um, scholarships. We don't get that many um any type of educational assistance. Um, before this whole thing started in the 1990s, a lot of our um, elders, I shouldn't call my mom an elder, but my mother was allowed to have free college. Um, but when all of this started and we were getting our recognition um, taken away or questioned, that's when it all went away. And unfortunately for me, I've had to pay everything out of pocket, but if they would love to give me some uh, money, I would love that, <laughs> pay my loans. <laughs> To be a member of a tribe, mm -hmm. how much Indian blood do you have to have? So it all depends on each tribal nation. Each tribal nation is very different. Um, our tribe is very, more, I would say, on the more stricter side um, because a lot of our tribal nation is as close to 100% as possible. Um, we need to be at least 25%, which doesn't seem that big, um, but it really is with the intermixing, with the um, unfortunate rapes that a lot of indigenous women had um, to go through in when settlers came around. Um, so our nation is one of those big, um, we need a big percentage, but if you go out to the Midwest, you have to be like 0.1%. Like it's very, very different. Yes. You had mentioned that um, one of the requirements for recognition was having historical records proving lineage from mm -hmm. the 1700s. And you mentioned that you guys have those. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the uh, hurdles to decoding some of those documents? You know, it's a long mm -hmm. thread for documents to be found. Are there like. I would say definitely the language barrier, um, just because a lot, I mean, you heard me talk a little bit in my language in the beginning, but a lot of our language is lost. And that's a big revitalization movement that a lot of tribal nations have been having to become sovereign is to learn their language again. However, a lot of a lot of documents that we do have that are from back then are in our own language. So trying to decode that um, and learn a language that was lost is very hard. Um, also, the language barrier that English people had when they came over, that a lot of what they wrote down may not necessarily be what Native Americans were saying because they didn't know what they were saying. It was that language barrier. So trying to decipher different Indian names during that time when, you know, a lot of our names were very foreign. They weren't, you know, James, Henry. Um, they were very long names. Um, to decipher that, I would say the language barrier is the, the biggest hurdle. you say it was the casino interest that kind of influenced the state to, you know, to question recognition? Yeah. And I think, um, you know, especially Donald Trump and his connections with politicians in New Jersey um, and all of that behind the scenes things that he was doing, um, kind of his mouth um, going into those politicians' ears was the biggest um, thing that challenged our nation. Going back to Richard's question for a second, um, in terms of proving like documentary um, paper trails, mm -hmm. are wampum belts considered part of that documentary evidence that I guess the term mm -hmm. is legally admissible? Yes. Part of that evidence stream? For those who do not know, wampum belts are um, belts that are made out of seashells, um, seashells that are named wampum. That was our type of uh, money system and trading system um, back in the day. And there has been a lot of wampum production sites that have been found in New Jersey. Um, if you guys know the story of William Penn, um, William Penn and the Lenape tribe had a very um, significant wampum belt um, that shows two people holding hands as friendship. Um, et cetera. And those wampum belts were treaty agreements.
agreements, they were different messages that our tribal nation would make within those belts. Um, they told stories and they told heritage and they told ancestry. Um, and for us, I would say it is a document that would be used. However, I don't think it is for the state. Just because again, they don't know how to decipher it and they don't wanna take the oral histories that have been passed down on what we know about wampum into consideration because it's not written down. You're discussing federal versus state and the differences amongst the two and the pros and cons associated with each one of them. Does the your current tribe, your tribe, the Manico Clan of Anape tribe, do they have an appetite to still pursue federal recognition? Or is there just a comfort level right now to stay at the state level of the recognition? Thank you, my uncle. <laughs> um, so we are actively working towards getting federal recognition. Luckily, we have had a lot of colleges come out um, and tell us that they want to help us, that they want to give their students a way to earn credits by helping research, by helping document um, our, our trail, our written trail to be able to become federally recognized. So we are actively working towards federal recognition. However, again, it's that long, long um, history that we need to be able to find and document. Um, and then other scholars like me and other scholars within my tribe try to work as much as we can on our full-time job schedule to have um, time to also research as much as we can to get that federal recognition status. And hopefully one day we'll be able to get it. As a caveat to that secondary question, in, in the instances of federal recognition, like for the people that have the tribes that have a federal, federal recognition now, do you know or have any line of sight as to how that federal money is cascaded to those particular tribes? Is it based on the size of the tribe or is it based on the amount of land they own? Or is there anything that factors into that equation that you're aware of? I would say, it, I personally do not know, but I would say it would have to do with the size of the tribe because depending on the size, depends on how much money each member of the tribe gets, um, depends on the size of land they're getting. If they're a smaller tribe, they're not gonna get as much land as a bigger tribe is going to. A lot of our East Coast federally recognized tribes do not have as big as federal land as our Midwest tribes do because there's more area there um, and there's more people there as well. Oh God, yes, mother. <laughs> Um, in addition to Tron being a factor as to why we are not recognized, isn't it true that Chris Christie played a part? And if so, can you tell everyone what his part in the decision was? He wants me to tell it. So, yes, Chris Christie, um, as we know, he was governor. Um, he had a big part um, within our lawsuit. We had talks with Chris Christie um, during his governorship about um, trying to decease the lawsuit to make it um, not a lawsuit anymore. He was going to send out an apology note officially um, to the state of New Jersey saying we apologize, but these these tribes are state recognized. However, Chris Christie had a very big scandal that happened where he hired a lot of people to um, beat up some of his opponents. And when that scandal came out, um, he stopped all contact with the tribe um, and he went back on Trump's side saying that we were just in it for the casino money. So... We know how his karma came now. So, <laughs> there is is a federally uh, recognized Lenape group mm -hmm. in Oklahoma, mm -hmm. and the federal recognition that you might be pursuing would be separate and distinct from that Lenape group. Yes. And why? Because we're all different families, all different clans. Um, so they are a different clan set than we are. Um, they're different families than we are. Even though we have the same lineage, lineage, they are all the way out there. So we can't have the same federal recognition as them since we are a separate group. And they also aren't part of Nanako as well. They are just strictly Lenape. Are they the only one? The only Lenape group that has federal So we have some up in Canada as well, um, but that is Canada's recognition. So yeah. Wisconsin. They're state recognized, I believe. 
Um, the last talks that we had with them, I think they are. Um, but again, it's just that hard, hard research base that needs to be done. Any further questions? This is out of your mm -hmm. uh, area to talk about today. I apologize. The uh, Common Town Historical Society has the museum uh, down in the corner, and you were one of the docents. We're also in discussions, pretty far along discussions, to come into possession of the collection of Native American, I believe, Nanto Lenape artifacts. They constitute the Woodruff Collection. It is, it is available for appointment only at the Bursting Free Public Library. How does how do those uh, physical artifact collections fit into the um, the tribe's uh, view of what is the tribe's view of uh, uh, people interested in history um, taking possession and having items that really came from real people? That, that's it's a pretty complicated question. Is that something you can speak about? Yeah. So um, as Britt said, I'm a high school history teacher now, but that was not at all what I thought I was going to be, even though I love my job so much. Um, the one job that I wanted to do was in museums to help museums have an accurate depiction of my tribe, my tribal nation. Um, and luckily, I've been able to work you know, at the Alan Carmen Prehistoric Museum and the Penn Museum. And they have been both such great museums that have allowed me to come in and have allowed me to shape the different exhibits to show our true history um, in a not racist way and in an accurate way. And I'm so just grateful for that. Um, and, you know, my time at Alan Carmen, you know, we're able to showcase all of these amazing artifacts that have now Lenape history perspective in them as well to where people can come in and they can say that this isn't just a pottery that this was a pottery um, piece that was used for ceremony and this is the background of ceremonies and these are the different spiritual beings that have to do with ceremonies because they allow me to go in and put my perspective and my history in um, and that just means the world to my tribal nation that not only are these artifacts being displayed, but they're being displayed with true context and true history now. And I just hope that we are able to do that so much more within New Jersey um, to all the museums to put Lenape perspective in there. So yeah, great, good, great relationship. <laughs> How large, what number do you have for your plan? We're like 5,000, right? 5,000? Cumberland County. Yeah, it's um so ours is like all of South Jersey. So not just Cumberland County, um, all of South Jersey. I would say a good five thousand. I think that was the last number. Delaware. So Delaware, they have um the Nanakote tribe and they have the Lenape tribe there. We're sister to tribes, um, but they're not specifically in our tribe or registered in our tribe. They're registered with their own tribe. They're separate. Yeah, they're they're two separate tribes in Delaware. You mentioned Christy and Trump mm -hmm. as being um, negatively involved in the certification of your tribe. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have documentation to show that? Yep. And it's all in my 130 page thesis. <laughs> if you look up Brianna D'Agostino on the web, it's the first link. <laughs> you don't need access or anything. Nope. And I would highly suggest everyone read it. <laughs> yep. Yeah, there's a lot of documentation on that. Luckily, again, I was able to get um, different documentation like emails um, and all of those letters that I so graciously put in there. So for the world to see. Do you use uh, DNA evidence as part of your uh, qualifications for uh, membership in the tribe? So we don't specifically use like ancestry DNA um, or any of those. We just base it on genealogy um, going back. Um, ancestry DNA and all of those DNA sites online, they actually don't have Native American state recognized like tribal blood within their system. So when I did it, it told me I was African American and that I was a Delaware slave. That's what it literally said on there. 
um, because they do not have Native American um, bloodline on there. So we don't use those. However, we do have a website called Missawakit, and it's our own tribally owned website, and it has all of our genealogy on there. And luckily, my mom, mom, she was one of the creators of that, and she put everybody in the tribe, all their mothers, brothers, aunts, uncles, genealogy in there. <laughs> so yeah, if you ever are bored, you can look through there. It's open to the public, and we trace it all the way back to the 1600s. So it's really interesting. You've mentioned language recovery. Mm -hmm. how, how enormous an issue is that? Do you still have among your 5,000 members mm -hmm. uh, the folks who are native speakers uh, of the language that you want to recover? Or We have no active um, language speakers. Um, I think we have maybe three. Um, that are very fluent in it. However, they aren't, you know, bilingual. They're just very fluent in the language. Um, and there are teachers. They're able to teach us. That's why I was so happy I was invited to that language camp um, because I got to see them, um, see some of the kids from out West. They were doing skits and they were doing play skits in our language. Um, and to see these little kids learning the language so far advanced than I am, it made me so inspired that, you know, hopefully one day these next generations will be bilingual in our language. They don't just have to go to the ancient doctors. Mm -hmm. but yeah, we have active um, teachers um, being able to teach us the language. However, it is that issue where, you know, we don't have words for modernized items like refrigerator, cell phone. So all of our language is very um, old, old tense, old language, because, you know, we got to talk about the basic stuff because we don't got those big fancy words. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about that and just how that affects? Yeah, so luckily, because I was not alive then, um, but because of this thesis, I was able to do a lot of oral interviews with elders, and I'm very happy about that because some of those elders that I did interviews with are no longer here, so they were able to share their last stories, and I have those on video now, um, but like I said, the American Indian Movement, the 1960s and 70s, you know, they specifically came to our tribe and they told our tribe that they need to rise up and to become those political leaders. So our tribe that had been in hiding for centuries finally came about. Um, and Mark Gould, um, along with different elders, um, came up and they rose as a political ent entity. And like I said, it took from the 1970s until 1982, a good 10 years for us to get that state recognition. And a lot of those elders talk about how they protested on Broad Street Hill in Bridgeton. Um, you know, talking to those senators, talking to those political bodies of Cumberland County, saying that, you know, we needed to be state recognized. Um, and they talk about that a lot. And they talk about their time in Bridgeton. Um, I know my mom can talk about it, too. Um, just being able to protest for their rights um, and being those strong people to rise up against, you know, a system that had previously not recognized us at all. And, you know, we were kind of this new thing coming about, even though we were so old, but it was because we were in hiding for so long um, that they didn't really know what we were about. And, you know, it took that long for us to get state recognized. What are the challenges with finding uh, written records that weren't necessarily like public access, but you had suspicions existed based on your mm -hmm. own history? Yeah, so um, luckily uh, there are some written records within the tribal system that aren't public access that I was able to get my hands on um, that are very, very old. Um, and we're so lucky to have those written records. But also, um, you know, I spent days within different archival places, whether that was, you know, um, Rowan's archives or the state of New Jersey, um, going through boxes and boxes of records where I found deeds that had, you know, our people's language on there, that had our people's signatures, that had no idea what it said. Um, but I knew it was our people because I knew some of the words. Um, and it was trying to get through those types of documents where, you know, it was unfamiliar to myself because of the language. Um, but I knew it was important for the thesis in some way. Um, and even in our federal recognition process as well. Um, 
a lot a lot of research and a lot of going through boxes um but it's like that all over. A lot of these archival places don't know the type of significant documents they have because they cannot read the language. And like, are there any, I guess, challenges with getting federal recognition? Like the federal government has certain documents that they're not released? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, that's our ongoing battle. Um, you know, I like to be straightforward and say that the government does not want us to be federally recognized. They don't want any tribe to be federally recognized because they don't want to give money. Um, so, you know, there are those hurdles because of their unwillingness to cooperate. Any other questions? Brianna, thank you so much for thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm on Rowan's website, so if you want to go check it out, please do. Um, mm -hmm. And we have refreshments, uh, so please help yourself. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.